Hello. Hey, Brenna. Hey. Hey, Brenna. There you go. All right. Let me link the notes. Hi everyone, for those that just joined, I'm putting in the Google Doc. Um, please feel free to go in, put your name down. Uh, if you have any updates or you want to share with a group, just um, write something in parentheses beside your name. And let's wait a couple of minutes for more folks to check all in. If there is anyone that can help us scribe, um, don't have to be too detailed, kind of just like take notes on uh, what sounds like action items that would be appreciated. Thank you again, Alex. <laughs> feel like you've been doing it a lot recently. Thank you very much. All right, a couple more folks joining in. So let's wait until yeah, connected, and then let's start. It's dress in the matrix. I don't know. You should tell us, Sandra. <laughs> Wish I knew. <laughs> that is true. Everyone wants to answer that. All right. Looks like everyone pretty much is connected now. So that's um, that. So I pasted in the um, the, the notes again. Um, please put in your. Um, your name and the attendances. Um, and if you have any updates, put an inference beside. Um, today we have a pretty packed agenda. Uh, we have several discussion topics and several um, new issues and, and updates on certain projects. So let's get started. So we're gonna go do a round um, of check-in. So let's see. No updates. Oh, before we get started, um, this meeting is recorded and um, it follows the TA CNCF um, code of conduct guidelines. So standard rules apply. So going through, I still see people filling in the list. So I will make sure I swing back to, to do another check. Um, uh, Diego, you have an update on the continent security map. I think we already have an agenda item on this, right? Um, so I can, we can talk about it then, or do you have something else that's not on the agenda? Um, no, no, but I can talk about it. So let me just share one second. I see. No, I, I mean, you, you, uh, I think we're already on the agenda, right? So, so we'll, we'll get yeah. to that later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, don't worry about that now then. All right. Next up, uh, Mark, PCI council update. Hey guys, this will be really fast. Uh, I mentioned this a few meetings back. Uh, PCI Council is writing a container security best practices document for payment card industry, PCI's payment card industry. So finance centric, but this is really just best practices for containers. So I'm gonna steal stuff from our own white papers and so on. So if people wanna be party to that and help me write paragraphs to that, I'm mainly looking at CICD aspects of this. That's the message. Awesome. And if you have any links, um, please add them to the 
document and chat. Yeah, I've got a list or you have to be party to it, thanks. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, Emily, do you want to do lexicon updates and then go? Yep. The stuff in the agenda. Okay. Um, I actually had two of them. So Lexicon um, is going forward doing an, the team is doing a great job of providing some of those definitions for terms. Um, not quite ready for everyone to start reviewing it yet, but um, they're getting closer. The other one was a quick update on security plows. Um, they've reached out to Crossplane and Artifact Hub um, at a minimum, those two, but I believe there's, there's a third one that I'm probably forgetting about. Started conversations, everyone seems interested, and that's kind of where we're at with those. Awesome. Um, is, there, is there any, um, is there any ask for any volunteers or any, any ways to contribute there? Um, so the, the security pals is just limited to the the three projects currently and the few and the those individuals that we have working on it this is to test um, our engagement early with uh, sandbox projects um, to determine their appetite for completing a self-assessment awesome all right cool um all right uh tim you want to talk a little bit about the automatic scribe Um, Tim, we can't hear you if you're talking. I just want to make sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, so I just put the link in there and love for people to just see how, how does it work. Uh, I think we're getting pretty close. You can do it asynchronously. You don't have to do it now. Um, pretty close to like starting to implement this so that you'd be able to access this. Um, the scribe, the search, I think one of the new cool features people were playing around with, if you add plus one, it automatically captures that snippet and puts it in the side, uh, but we don't need to spend time on it right now. You guys can look at it on your own and then give me feedback because I'm getting close to like getting to implementation to make it available for all of you guys uh, for uh, transcription and summaries. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. Yep. Yeah, it's a, really, it's a really cool thing. And it, yeah, um, I think one of the nice features if you go to the site, it's like if someone in the chat said like, Plus one something or like this, it will kind of try and detect what what's important in action items and kind of create yeah. a separate chart for them. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, Tim. Um, uh, going through the updates here. Uh, Robert says he's going to be joining late. Um, we can put him on the agenda later. Uh, Rageshri. Um, okay. So your update was covered by Emily. That's all good. Um, we had a TLC meeting um, on Tuesday. Um, Andreas and I were there to kind of represent the SIG and they were talking about incubation processes. And the, the, the main part of it is like, they're, they're making the TLC sponsor own the entire incubation process. Um, Andreas, do, do you want to talk a little bit or chime in on that? Yeah, sorry, I was just typing, pasting the PR and chat for those interested in the details. But the gist of it is the TOC is trying to streamline the incubation process by appointing a designated talk sponsor up front. So rather than a project going over the due diligence requirements and chasing different SIGs and filling out the doc ahead of time, they would first find someone in the talk to sponsor the project and handhold them and direct them throughout the process. So from a six security perspective, we would typically either hear from, well, from this point on, we'd be hearing from the talk liaison or from the talk sponsor for the project. Uh, if we have a project in the pipeline, we need a security review or we need a recommendation rather than some project we might have not have heard of coming to present to us first try to get buy-in for us to try to go sell it to the talk. So that's the, the summary of it. I'm pasting the PR right here. I can scratch all the text that I was writing around it and just give you the link. Awesome. Yeah, and I think I think throughout, like we were having some conversations on the call 
about you know what is what is really request of the sick and i think it is acknowledged that sick security is kind of a special case in which our recommendation is kind of um a little bit different from the other six, right? It's not just with the, if it's within the ecosystem and it's good technology, but even for the non-security projects, we, we do also um, need to provide some evaluation of that. And to quickly add on to that, um, that was a topic of conversation today with the talk liaisons, Liz and Justin, um, that they're looking at ways in which we can highlight the security of projects, regardless of the stage that they're at and what mechanisms we can engage with them either asynchronously or synchronously to improve their overall security posture. That's right. Ultimately, that's the goal. Yeah, and well, the other thing is it was typically very consuming for, for the talk. You have the entire TOC on the call listening to a proposal to hear out things that they could have read through the read read me file of read me file of, of the project. So also moving away from presentation proposals and more like fleshed out uh, written proposals. But from a security standpoint, we would still want to hear presentations throughout assessment processes because it helps us inform the assessment and a lot of the scenarios in which a project might be deployed. So yeah, well, this has yet to be merged. We'll, we'll learn more as, as this gets implemented and we go through it. Awesome. See how much changes. Cool. All right. Uh, let's get to um, the agenda. Um, so quick announcement before we head to Tim, just um, since he has to leave a little early. So quick reminder, Cloud Native Security Day is May the 4th. Um, there are discount coupons that have been sent out um, in the SIG mailing list. So if you are not yet subscribed to the SIG mailing list, please do so. <laughs> um, yeah, so there, there's like, a, I think it has a 20% discount or something. Um, any additional um, notes over there, Andrew and Emily? Oh, that's pretty much it. You're all good. Awesome. All right, let's hit to Tim then. Um, so Tim presented a couple of weeks back and then this is a follow-up i'm gonna pass it to you tim to, to kind of do the introduction I, okay I'm, super yeah thanks so I, it seemed like a good time we were working on the white paper I, I i only read it like three weeks ago so maybe some of the observations are not germane at this point um but uh i'm also coming up with the roadmap and the way i kind of like think about roadmaps is i like to write out like um a blog that like tells the overarching story and then I figure out kind of what fits into it. And I figured this is like a really good group for us to figure out, um, it just makes sense. And the, the difference at the time when I read it, but it's how I was starting out my blog and how I think through the roadmap was getting a handle on the problem space and seeing, well, what, what seems to be the issues, what are our priority? And then for this group, what, what should we try to um, solve for, or even can we solve for them? So that's what I wanted to like get some feedback on really quickly. So, um, so here's how I started was thinking, you know, and at the time when I read it, I was like, well, it would help to understand when we talk about supply chain, where are the problems so we could visualize? And I'm not saying this is the right, way. I liked it because it was a good starting point. There's lots of different ways you could do it. But it, it does start to put into context, okay, there are lots of pieces in a supply chain. And then what tend to be the attack vectors uh, ba based on that? And then from there, iterate. Because I think last time we started to go down into the tooling, tool chain discussion, and I felt, oh, it, it might be better to start, hey, let's frame it as what the problems are. And then we can iterate on tools or a list of tools and that would be helpful for me too. So, so I'd love some thoughts and feedback on that. That's kind of how I've been doing it. And then I try to make it a little bit more um, explicit in my own mind, um, what is the range of the attack vectors? And so this is a bunch of different sources and just stuff that I threw in there. And this is where I 
could use some 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 guidance, but you can kind of see there's one bucket around code signing. Like that seems to be a bucket that stands alone, but there's a couple of different ways people um, access it. Um, something that we would call, I think the term is pretty good, distribution vectors, which is how do they get the malware to be distributed? Uh, this is the one which I was sort of pinging on a little bit because it wasn't really covered in either in, in, in really great detail in many of the sources um, I've read, but I've been thinking about a lot was, you know, the identity problem, um, which is, you know, a bad actor, unknown actor, or, a, you know, a, a fraudulent actor, and, and kind of like, how do they, you know, do that? And if, if you kind of think about, it, we don't, sometimes we don't really even know who's contributing, and we think they're legitimate, or they're bad, or, or and it was a takeover. And then very specific so, things. So, oh, yeah. Could, could you give like a, a little bit of context just in case for those people that were not previous on the previous call um uh -huh. what is kind of like the the um the the end goal at least oh for, for right the foundation yeah yeah so the end goal was i wanted to figure out what do we want to do in terms of approaches like we already are planning on rolling out some kind of basic vulnerability detection that has dependency mapping that seems to be kind of well defined, and I, I wanted to see what else is 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 next. Like the next thing that we know is going to be key uh, 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 key key sc sc scanning for keys, and uh, sort of kind of fits somewhere in SCI, I suppose, kind of sub bullet. But some of the things I was getting stuck on was, well, are people interested in you know? DAS, there's a lot of complexity because I started to go down the path of evaluating a DAS solution, but I was like, oh, but you know, everybody's runtime is sort of different. Do people want to bother with instrumenting that? Blah, 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 blah. SAST, fuzzing. Um, and then I started exploring a uh, solution uh, around code search, which was uh, more initially around um, improving uh, productivity. Uh, for developers. So it's like, you know, imagine it's like Splunk or Google, but for your code. But I, I started to ask the, the, the creators of this uh, tool, you know, is there a security uh, application? Because I feel sometimes there's issues when you have sort of these vulnerability databases, whereas people who are close to the code may start to think through uh, what the vulnerability patterns are. They may just want to do a fast search in real time. Um, or build out their own libraries on their own. So I, I, I want my end state is this, like what do you guys think we should try to consider making a standard offering that's enabled through a security portal for projects to ease the instrumentation and uh, reporting. Uh, but before I could get to the tools, I wanted to understand, well, what are, meaningful problems. And then we can kind of say, well, yeah, let's try to explore these tools. Tim, and when you say offering, that would be an offering from the Linux Foundation, a host. That's correct. That's yeah. correct. And so uh, the way we've been doing it is, and that's why the tooling discussion will be in fact valuable when we get there is, uh, and, and one of the things I had he heard was, oh, well, there's lots of different tools. I have to pick a tool. How do you get neutrality? So we're trying to take that out by saying, okay, we're going to vet vendor A, work out some arrangement. And a lot of times we have to make bespoke arrangements in terms of billing or integrations or the UX um, to solve for certain things. So, you know, and the goal would be, okay, now you have a single control plane that you could then govern it for a project, instrument your repos and, you know, kind of simplify and not have people have to go and search a vendor and then do a POC and all this other stuff. Hey Tim, it's, it's Vinod. I think there is a similar approach under OSSF in, in Open Software yeah. Security Foundation, and that they are doing creating their own tools and services to improve the supply chain security. Right. right. So, so do do yeah. you want just this to be focused on commercial vendors, or do you just want to? No, no, no. You know, I, I definitely want the open. I, I've tried to reach out to Open SSF, and I, I I couldn't get clarity how far along the tools were. Uh, mm -hmm. whether we should do it or not. And so I figured, let me uh, uh, triangulate by having, you know, a different set of practitioners, some that you guys might be uh, neutral, whether it's from open SSF or commercial versus they are 
doing it. And that way I can kind of harmonize between the two. I, I don't have a clear picture of yeah. what they're going to do, when it's going to be available, what's the difference between that and commercial tools that we yeah. try to offer. So I think that's part of this exercise. Yeah, so the, the, they are going beyond SEA and uh, vulnerability, right? So they are also considering other attributes about uh, open source libraries, securities and risk. Like they do have a package feed and a criticality score. There are multiple tools around there and they have a mm. dashboard where they calculate all these metrics and give you some level of score for, the, for an open source package, right? So um, I think it's good to consider those tools and some of these tools yeah. are not necessarily going to help that much with the supply chain problem. It may help with the application security of the software uh, in you know, building inside a company, not necessarily a supply chain security specific, right? Like a SaaS, it is not that practical to scan all the open source code through a SaaS. Like uh, I, I don't know how many companies are doing that. And um, even, yeah, so SEA itself is kind of a limited approach for uh, open source security. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of what I've been sensing too, but I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't tell when I synced up with David, what's the status on, you know, release and is it working and is the metrics well-defined? Um, if, if all the tools from, so, on the extreme, if everything from OpenSSF will fit all the needs and requirements from a group like this, then problem solved. If there's a gap and we need some commercial tool then or other tool, then I would like to understand that. One example, for example, is fuzzing. So when I would talk to them, they said, well, yeah, you know, open, open fuzz is available. But part of me was like, but even if it's available, how easy is it? and how widespread is it used across projects? And so there we would be tackling, okay, maybe we have a control plane, which is makes it much easier for everyone to run code against open fuzz if that isn't done, or you know helps them to uh, record the, the output or select what the libraries use. Like I, 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 that, that I'm open to as well. So I have a quick question, um, yeah. Tim. Is, is there a path or a mechanism by which as the SIG discovers gaps in these particular areas that we're expected to engage with the foundation to highlight it, an overwhelming need in this particular area? We have a lot of projects ongoing. The supply chain paper is one of them. There's um, the map. And as some of the SIG leadership, as well as a lot of the SIG members and the community members are discussing like the current state of things, another attack just happened. What, what do we do? What are we recommending to people, um, we're, we're slowly starting to realize key areas such as the ones that you pointed out for which there is a lack of tooling that's available to the community. And we're struggling with where do we, where do we write all that down <laughs> right now that huh. looks like cards in our repo. Um, but is there a, a path by which we can engage and say, hey, we were doing X, Y, and Z. We've noticed that this is a potential problem area and we'd like you guys to focus on this or just, just a place where we can point to. That's a super great question to which I don't have an answer. Um, and given I don't have an answer, we could you know, co-create it here. Like, you know, you guys are the most active. What's useful for you? I, I actually don't have it. It's a super great answer. And I think having a solution would be super. I, I, I don't have a prescription at this point. So what, what, what do you think works for you? And if it's like the least friction and highest fidelity for you, then I'll just follow. And then I'll just use that as a source of truth for the well, CNCF SIG. I think you have, uh, you've got a couple of areas that are already here that are called out as potential problem cases. Um, I think if it's intended to be our SIG ownership of those problem areas from a security focus, remember that that's kind of like how we're scoped, maybe having something akin to this listing in our repo where we, we've particularly called out problem space. Um, and then just engaging with the foundation to be like, hey, you can always go here and look for any things that we identify. But again, we're going to be limited in scope to just that. Whereas storage, 
secrets management. There's a couple of other areas that uh, have similar problems where they're finding gaps in the community that are not necessarily security specific. So I see. I know that at least the, the TOC has asked us to kind of engage them with um, helping to identify where there may be not really gaps, well, gaps in terms of open source projects. Um, I think we have kind of that. We should have a discussion there. Uh, and part of part of you know the the, the landscape slash security map was to to gather some data. So I think that um, what you laid out here, Tim, is is, is a, probably a good start as well uh -huh. to, to kind of have a discussion around this. Um, but so so I, I just wanna to 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 understand. So you that's um I think that's like two different discussion points. One of them is discussing what are some things that we need to do to enable like maybe invest in a new project to enable the security community as a whole. And this specific problem that um, we are looking, looking at here is how do I increase the security of uh, open source projects with um, by providing a, a service, right? Just to make sure that I'm, I'm not mixing up two of them. Yeah, I, I, that sounds right, you know? Okay. And, and I, I tried, so this one I started from scratch, but then we did that whole exercise uh, for the DOD and I reached back to them and say, hey, what's the published outcome for what you guys did? They, didn't, they haven't gotten back to me, the two uh, folks that are, that are working on it. So I, you know, we could always, you know, I like the format that we did last time too as a, a spreadsheet and, you know, that was super valuable. So I, I'm pretty open and I, I, I'm hearing the two things. One is, what's the list that you guys are like, this one's probably not a very great, great list. Cause I just pulled it out of my, <laughs> whatever, kind of like jamming through it just to give a context, but you guys probably know a lot more. Um, and then, like you said, wh where do we go to, to, to find it? So I, I'm open to what they think the form, the right form factor um, is meaning, you know, I like the idea of a repo. Um, I also liked how we had that, spreadsheet which allowed us to kind of say here's the problem here's what the thing with the solution was that seemed interesting because then you could add on here's how we plan to do implementation um or here's an existing solution then a kind of debate oh open ssf solves this or this is a better solution and stuff like that so those would be the outcomes but i don't have a prescription Tim, i think there there should be consideration that a lot of the projects are run by skeleton crews and yep, the fact yep. that they don't do these things are is not out of neglect is they prioritized other things exactly yeah and so, i think oh go ahead go ahead and, and in, in some ways you've actually stated the sub problem which we're trying to solve is how do we make it super easy how do we make it for those that are of skeleton crews to still have some level of security assurance. And so that's like the the higher order bit question is, okay, what's the scope of the problems, which I'm turning to you, know, you guys as practitioners, and what it is. And then the product aspect is, okay, how do we enable it for the persona of someone who doesn't really have time? Yeah. And like take flossing, for example, I've seen Mm -hmm. The maintainers of the fossing projects or the creators of a, of a fossing tool approach CNCF projects and say, hey, uh, we'll help you implement fossing. And maintainers like don't have actually not taken those offers, even though they're getting it from the expert. And mm -hmm. a lot of it is, well, there's there's a whole lot more to this and, and there are implications and their considerations. So if it were something similar to the CNCF service desk model where the LF is going to make a person available to work with maintainers and help them expedite all the due diligence to be able to, like the problem is not really technology, right? It's, it's putting it, mm -hmm. yeah, going back to your, your diagram that like even system design stage, 
and making yep. sure that well yes there's there's this thing we can consume as a service great tooling but making sure you can handhold the project maintainers and make it and even do it for them just like do that augmentation for them so that it's not additional overhead where they don't understand the implications of well how is this going to change mm. our, our build pipeline how is this going to change the thread model of our, of our project like is this is going to uncover stuff that we're not ready to tackle at this point etc cetera, etc cetera. yeah that's a good point i i, I really yeah. i really like that as well actually yeah let me just pick yeah. plus one for me. yeah i was thinking about fuzzing as well i was thinking about you know the kind of like domain knowledge that you would need to know to implement a fuzzer um yeah to adapt to your application but like if it's a service-based model you know a lot of yeah. these things could be uh even if like just open source tooling right it doesn't have to be a service you could just like oh we we'll do a security process for you we'll write a cicd pipeline for you or something like that yep like e yep. even take like running the web infrastructure for web pages of the projects maintainers are not doing that and there's been like some shuffling on the cncf side where the people that help put up netlify and do the load balancing and do cloudflare for for these projects has moved on and now like maintainers are scrambling because they haven't dealt with this stuff before. Mm. I, I'd love to hear those use cases on the deployment side. And maybe that's something that we, you know, we just iterated on this. So I just wanted to kick it off. It seems like there's some things, I don't have answers on like where we go uh, to, to put those in there. I'll take my lead from you guys because I think it's whatever's the least friction for you that gives lowest friction and highest fidelity. Would be good to talk to a few different projects and interview them, understand their paints, because I'm speaking strictly from the experience of Inspire, but mileage okay. varies, right? Okay, cool. All right. Well, the that's it for me. Maybe what we do is I, I kind of jump to another meeting, but I think we framed it, and then let's see what may, happens in the next week or two on thoughts that we come out we can we also have the slack in terms of what you guys want to do in terms of the repo location like where the discussion and, and the things go mm -hmm. and i think that seems like a good starting point does that sound good yep um okay. thanks so much tim super oh, thanks you guys <laughs> all right bye bye okay yeah um and also i think i will um open up an issue for the, the point that Emily brought up with, which is like kind of looking at gaps, right? I think already did it. It's posted awesome. in the chat. <laughs> great, great. Uh, awesome. So I think that um, all right. And then let me let me open this. I'll open the issue for Tim as well, so that we can at least get the thread going for this. Um, and next on the agenda item is you, Emily. So, oh yeah. Yes. All right. Let me go up and figure out what I'm talking about. Ah. Meeting summaries, first and foremost. Um, so for those of you that probably already know, and those of you that don't, SIG Security is considered a global group, um, a global community spanning multiple time zones. Um, and as a result of that expansion and community interest, we do have an APAC region being that occurs where they have lots of conversations, they are active community members, and they are engaged in these discussions. Um, so in an effort to ensure that the work that they're doing as part of the SIG is included in our discussions I have made an adjustment to the meeting template to include a review as part of the attendance of the notes that came from the last meeting. And this is going to be reflected both for the APAC region as well as this region. So at the start of our meetings, we should, or the facilitator should go through and do um, a quick summary of what was discussed at the other regions meeting, and then APAC would do the same. This is in an effort to be a lot more inclusive about our globally diverse community. So that's the first item. And then the second one is inclusion language changes. 
Um, this is issue number 478. It was originally brought up by um, Andres, and I wanted to bring this back to the community as something that I think we can actually get taken care of. So this is um, regarding the use of non-inclusive terms within our repository. We do have a few of them to include the branching schema by which we employ within the SIG. So what this is, is it would entail somebody going through, probably grepping through all of our files, doing changes to some of the terminology, as well as a decision point in which we switch over from the master branch over to the main. Um, this is a especially important because the talk has already made this change and initially we held off on it because we were concerned about breaking all of our links. So this is, while it may seem like a small change, I understand that it's a, it's a big ask by the community to take care of this. Awesome. And I, I think that also, I was just looking at the issue there, so the link and, uh, and you know, there's a whole discussion thread on tooling that can help with this as well. So this is a great issue for somebody that wants to have a positive, long lasting impact on the SIG and how we move forward and kind of these engagements, as well as you will be exposed to pretty much every part of the repo and you will learn a lot in the process. And, and I would say, um, I would say like, don't feel like you have to do like gigantic PR and do everything at once. If you can identify, okay, you know, I'll, I'll do the changes within this single document or within the set of files, you know, feel free to just go ahead and create a PR. Or start small and as you as you do a PR, refer back to the issue, do a couple of them at a time and we can save the, the major branch change at the end. In terms of the inclusive naming, I mean, it was in the New York Times recently in terms of like the crew that put that all together and stuff like that. I think it's an amazing initiative for all of us here. So um, kind of like putting my two cents in here, even though it's un un unsolicited, but uh, it's it's a really amazing initiative. They've done a bunch of projects. So I think it would be awesome. And whatever I can do to contribute, I'm going to do here. Awesome. Okay, so the issue is in the document. I'm going to paste it in the chat as well. Cool, and um, we have our last agenda item for today, which is project criteria for listing projects in the cognitive security map. Um, Diego, do you yep. want to? Yeah, as um, see a second. Let's see if I can share. No, I cannot share right now. Anyway, permissions thingy. Okay, so um, the thing is that um, I think most of you know that we have been working for a while in the uh, cloud native security map. I'm going to put in the chat the link of the issue. And apart from that, we've been working on the web version so that people can see what are the um, recommendations, what are the different areas related to the um, um, Cloud Native Security White Paper and how people can see the projects that can help them, examples and descriptions and having more information. Uh, but now that we have, um, we're close to complete the, all the areas of the documents and uh, there have been some questions like, we are having a lot of contributors and some of the projects that can be included might not be um, potentially stable enough, mature enough or with the right quality. So we started thinking what will be the right uh, betting conditions. So how people can trust that the information that we show is going to be useful because we don't want to confuse people and say like, oh, use this open source project that was built five years ago and nobody did the commit in four years. So, because that will uh, reduce the 
competence of, of the audience. So a minimum criteria that we are starting to, to write down is things that we consider that can be useful to filter a few of those projects. And that's why we wanted to present to you the, what are the options if you agree. We're trying to see what will be a similar criteria, for example, for sandbox projects in the CNCF. But then uh, the process needs to be quite clear at the beginning rather than going through a review or pool. We would like that people know in advance how they can propose a project. So things like the criteria will be something like the project has more than one contributor and the project has more than six months of lifetime. There are regular releases and there are active commits in the in the last six months. And it's a priority if it can be a CNCF project or Linux Foundation relationship. So that this is a discussion from the rest of the group of what is appropriate, any other suggestion, what is important. But the, the goal is to always provide good quality projects so that people trust this resource. Any questions? Do you have a, do you have a, a list that um, you can maybe share on the screen? And I don't have a link right now, but I will say I'll put something like this in the chat. Right now. But this is the start of the essential elements, but um, that's why we wanted to bring it forward. If somebody has some objection, suggestions, or indications of a good reference of starting filtering projects. Otherwise, we will just move forward with a few more detailed descriptions in the, when the contributors wants to add some projects and and that will be the reference. So, so part of this is kind of, um, uh, I think we, we were discussing this as well, is um, we hope to not get too many angry messages from people to be like, oh, I was in my project, not why is it in this list, or why is it like, you know, why is this guy's project in but not mine? <laughs> Uh, and I think the, the idea is to make it as objective as possible and to have a criteria that I think covers all the bases that, that, that people should care about. Um, I think we haven't really decided on exactly what the, we have this called criteria, but I think like maybe that is also consideration to like the weight for it. Maybe, you know, having more than one contributor is going to be at least a minimum requirement uh, and then, you know, being CNCF for the NAS Foundation project is like nice to have these few additional points, but it's, it's not, it's not a requirement to be in the list. When you say more than one contributor, shouldn't that be like meeting certain buzz factors? Say again, sorry. When you said having I didn't more get than the last part. contributors, when you're saying having more than one contributor, you mean total one contributor to the project or one contributor from, from here? Um, total more than one, I think. Right, Diego. Yeah. Yeah, more than one. We we, we might want to raise that you know with like best practices badge or sandbox incubation criteria. We we really seek that. Well, you, the buzz factor is is this formula. If the whole project were to take a field trip and they're involved in an accident, unfortunately that. Would the project still succeed and, and, and carry on without this group of people? And there's there's ways to calculate that. You want <laughs> Emily's laughing by how I framed that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but it, it's the um not necessarily the vendor independence portion of a given project, but more about the project continuity success. But that's, I believe, the right way to, to say that. Right. If somebody inadvertently becomes unavailable, will they still be successful? The, the nicer version of that is the lottery factor. So pretend the, pro the project person won the lottery. 
and they can't they're not going to do open source anymore they're going to go and live on an island or something yeah so we we, we are looking for um didn't we didn't we all win the lottery being part of this group with, with andres and diego didn't we all win the lottery no? <laughs> sorry, sorry go ahead diego <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just it's just to make it more clear because as Brandon said, like we we think that people say, oh, why my weekend project is not included there because I think it's really nice and help people. Um, then, rather than having a um, just a long conversation with uh, some people, just like we think it's not aligned with these specific criteria. I think walking that line between allowing um, users to be more informed versus actually providing a grade is very tricky. Um, I think that a lot of it has to do with how we present or how we label some of that. Um, so if the intent is to allow a user to make a more informed decision about this, being 100% transparent and kind of the things that we would be concerned with were we evaluating the project, um, I think I think is very important. Um, as far as more than one contributor, I would also I would make the recommendation um, that it should be more than two first off, um, because they could you can have two people and they could be doing awesome and amazing work, but they can also just go to the same company together or abandon the project together or leave that one person overwhelmed with the massive amount of things. Um, to that end, I think that we should be very clear and upfront about like what what kind of those expectations are and and cite that principle that Rory eloquently stated for us, the lottery one, um, as the kind of the reasoning for why we're looking at that particularly. Sounds good, yeah. We were just, um, just putting this for debate to, to make a richer decision. Another thing that we were, were also, I think, thinking about is, you know, whether can we kind of make whether we should just you either make it or you don't and you're on the list or not or we have like multiple categories of of projects like you know obviously a project with like 12,000 stars cnc have graduated that project and then um you know a project from uh from that's much smaller right then like is there do we want to make the distinction between those two things? And then that also becomes a tricky exercise. Is there anything in the criteria about some sort of proxy for measuring how widely a product has been adopted or how widely a project is being used. Um, I think I recall um, in the, the CNCF broad-based landscape, um, there's something about, you know, open source projects with 300 or more stars, which I assume is sort of being as a proxy for, if you've got 300 or more stars, there's at least a few people using your project. Um, do we have anything like that under consideration in these criteria? Yeah, I think that we we talk about that, but there's um, always sometimes it's the um, yeah it's to put a an, a limit and a number that we consider appropriate because why why three hundred and not five hundred or two hundred? Yeah, the other problem with the specific GitHub stars is that quickly becomes a popularity contest. Um, and we would like to avoid that at all costs. So it's a good idea. And if we figure out a way to do um, a somewhat accurate measurement about the use of a project across industry, that would go a long way to helping them in seeking incubation and graduation criteria, because um, that, that highlights project maturity. So I think that 
was more about what we're looking for is like, what is the project maturity? How, how do we quantify that as something? And maybe, maybe that's um, not necessarily a fixing a numerical value for assignment, but showcasing where that falls on that um, chasm chart. Is it early, early adopter? Is it innovation? Is it like, where is it at on that curve? Is there any source, reliable source, to identify the usage by other parties that you would recommend? Anyone? I honestly can't think of anything. Like, if GitHub had that content for how often um, a project was cloned on a recurring basis from a centralized or singular IP address, I think that would be a privacy violation, <laughs> but well, that would be unique, unique cloners, right? By user account, I think they, they, they do that. Where, um, where is container images that Docker Hub? No, I know have that because because uh, Justin Carmack was talking about it uh, today on, on okay. Twitter. But uh, um, but yeah, I, I don't think for where where it's not a Docker image, I don't know if they've got that. Yeah, I'm, I'm also worried like a lot of this information isn't necessarily public, and I feel like it's also gonna take a lot of effort for us to go to every single individual project and ask for it. Uh, I think like CNCF. Uh, this one I just put in chat, Brendan, is, is one that's fairly good at a, at a high level. It's not going to go in depth, right? In terms of just understanding contributors, contributions, commits, repositories, that type of thing. I just found out about this like two weeks ago and, you know, like it's pretty incredible. Like you can kind of see an overview of each one of the underlying projects how many lines of codes are there but like again it doesn't stick to a specific criteria but i would assume that the upper like line of these of okay x amount of co lines of code x amount of contributors would would be something mm -hmm. that would um be something that precludes them from, or adds them to whatever thing we have here and again i think this is beta but uh it's been super useful in uh some of the recent pursuits i'm in well, oh, that's cool. They help you update that all that GitHub information we were just talking about. So. I think that might be a good source to look at. With lots well, of I can leave the meeting. I contributed it. something, guys. I can. I ever, you all. I can. I can leave. It's something. It's not an PR. Oh, hey, it doesn't Rory, count. I'm not just a hat, dude. I'm not just a hat. Sorry. Good. I would say your biggest contribution this this meeting is secure Batman. <laughs> It'll be the next project name. <laughs> you know, an, an often overlooked file, but a great indicator of the project health is the adopters file. If there are public adopters, it's one to look at and encouraging people to do that. Yes, for security projects, there's a lot of organizations that won't publicly state this is what we do, but well, there's there's other signs of evidence whether a project is, is well adopted or not versus a developer spawn up 200,000 bots to go do a Git clone from this thing. So a lot of certain metrics, depending how you measure them, can be not very meaningful and, and just a ton of noise because maybe someone cloned this thing once, but they rolled it out as a massive production deployment versus someone has a, a big lab and they've been pulling this over and over and over again. I think that's why all these um, things make it a little bit difficult yeah. to make a clear cut quickly. I would add on to that. That's actually a good suggestion, Andres. It triggered something else for me. If we have the ability to determine whether or not there is a security file in the repo, because there is a security tab in GitHub now that talks about whether or not there is a security policy or security advisories. And one of the things that we talked about in the security review process was being able to assist uh, projects in creating their security file within the repository. And making sure it's discoverable because it might exist yes. in the contributing file or in the maintenance file. Gotcha. Oh. Yeah, I see this now. Yeah. And, and another, like a lot, a lot of CNCF projects have dedicated community managers, and these community managers run surveys at certain 
cadence and often there are like net promoter score questions in there. Would you recommend the product to others? Are you actively planning on implementing this product? We should, and we should try to encourage people to put those things on, on their repositories to have it readily discoverable and we don't have to chase community managers or these guys. Okay. Okay, I think that's it. I think we will we'll write down all these details and, and propose a final version of all the properties that we think are important. Awesome, thanks Diego. Oh. Cool, a um, couple of minutes left. Um, any other topics that people want to bring up? Um, any other things that people want to maybe suggest for next week's? meeting and wait next week is next week we do not have a meeting wait. may 5th, 5th there is no <laughs> yeah. meeting because it's kubecon europe yeah. so hopefully everybody can attend and show up and have a lot of fun and i expect to see every single one of you at cloud native security day and i will be personally upset if you don't make it i will cry andres will hear about it <laughs> Wait, are most people here going to be sleeping during the event? <laughs> well, at least half the event, you know, I'm going to with that. <laughs> awesome. You can all just come to the proper time zone, which is summertime, <laughs> come on, for a week. Not that bad. Yeah, yeah. We're all moving in, bro. You have a, you have a spare 10, 15, 20 bedrooms No. No, oh, I've, I've got like a couple of acres. I live in the middle of nowhere. This, this I, I was going to say, he, he will offer hiking tours for all of us. Yeah. <laughs> are, are you saying that Aqua is sponsoring us? <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, slow down, story. Magno. No, slow no, down. No. <laughs> I'll get in trouble with that one. <laughs> it's recorded. All right. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. And, and it shouldn't be long after that that we regroup to start talking about North America. So, yeah. That's right. So if you're interested in North America, keep that in your back pocket and stock the issues while you're going through and trying to close some of them out because you're awesome and you like to contribute. Sponsorships. From Aqua. <laughs> hey. Rory, you're going to get a lot of emails soon. Oh, man. That, that's, a, that's our action <laughs> item. Send no our email for all the money. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.